to the Conservation Gallery number two. Most of you are here last winter, and you remember the first installation of the Conservation Gallery was last winter. That was when we did the major switch up, and instead of just telling the story of the bison in the Bison Gallery, we started telling a wider story and incorporating a number of different species. So this, for those of you who remember Conservation Gallery 1, Conservation Gallery Installation 2 is similar in many ways, but there are some new pieces that are cycled in, and there is uh, the wolf actually cycled out, so we no longer have the wolf story in here. Instead, we have the African lion. So those are the major changes. Uh, with this exhibition, you will hear and see the, a variety of different conservation stories, ranging from animals like the polar bear and the tiger and the elephant, which are, their very existence is in question right now. It's a very critical uh, situation and story that needs to be told to the animal like the bison that at one time was on the brink of extinction and then due to successful conservation efforts, it's doing quite well. Of course, the numbers will never compare to what they were. Similarly, the pronghorn yes. has, um, has gone from being much more critically endangered to um, some measures being taken to bring the numbers back up, although there are still some issues, which if you listen to the bison pronghorn story through the on sale option, you'll hear that story and some of the things with the overpasses down by uh, Pinedale, which are designed to mitigate some of the threats that the pronghorn face, the fencing issue, of course, too. So, um, I'm going to point out some of the new things here, some of the new pieces. This Henri Rousseau painting here was not up last winter because it's a, a pretty new uh, acquisition. It was donated to the museum in 2014. And Henri Rousseau is a French artist. He lived from 1844 to 1910, but he never, never traveled outside of France. So when you look at this exotic tiger in its landscape there, um, know that he did not travel to Asia. He spent a lot of time in the Jardin de Plantes in Paris, where there were exotic animals and exotic, you know, both the flora and the fauna to be studied, and he did a lot of studying there. His contemporary and a friend of his was um, uh, blanking on his name, Wilhelm Kuhnert. And Wilhelm Kuhnert was a little bit younger, but he did travel to the other continents. So there's the contrast between the two. But even though they had different methods of becoming experts and learning what they want, you know, learning the particulars of what the animals and the plants looked like. But the fact that both of them were interested in exotic locales reflects the height of the colonial era and people were just fascinated by what was out there in these different exotic species and plants they've never seen before. So this is new to the collection and also new to Conservation Gallery. Some other new additions, if you turn around behind Marsha here, you see the big Theodore Waddell painting. He's a Montana artist and he's better known for paintings of horses and cattle, but he has recently started including bison in his, as subject for his paintings. He is, uh, and, that, and that is a reflection of how the bison, you're seeing more of them in the area where he comes from, he's seeing more and more bison, and so they started becoming subjects for his paintings. It reflects how well they're doing in certain parts of the country. He's. His work is definitely influenced by abstract expressionism. So when he talks about his work, he references the influence of Franz Klein, Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, and there is a fabulous quote that he talks about the surface of his painting. So when you get close, maybe even from far away, you can see the richness of, and the thickness of the paint that he's playing around with here. And his quote is, he says, I didn't realize how important these influences, meaning the influences of the abstract expressionists, were. These painters wanted you to know that the canvas had a presence, more than their illusionistic predecessors. The paint had its own identity, so it's very much about the process of painting, as much as it is about bison in the landscape. Um, the paint had its own identity as well, with thick swatches, drips, and blurbs, which is a fabulous quote by Theodore Waddell. 
And the other new additions, the two bison sculpture, were not out previously in the Conservation Gallery. We have Edwin Deming bison, and then we have the Rizent, uh, which is the European bison by Joseph Kallenberg. And it's great to have them side by side so that we can talk to people about the difference in the confirmation between the two species. You can really see it between the European bison and the American bison. So one, another thing that we are hoping to do with this installation, and I think we're going to be getting better at it all the time, is communicate with people on a, on a last, and make a lasting impact in terms of the conservation stories. And that is something, what, what Adam has said here, he says, uh, let's see, Adam has said, artists have played a role in picturing the many species on the edge of extinction, both in North America and abroad. This exhibit presents images of animals alongside brief, informative text discussing, discussing the conservation status of each creature. So this year's installation features bison, pronghorn, lions, elephants, tigers, and polar bears. So the bigger panels that you see, like this one right here about the bison, had the first uh, section of that tells about what is the conservation status, what's the conservation history of that particular animal, and then he includes interesting facts with the bullet points underneath. The, the lion is, uh, is a new one, and it's one that maybe you're not as familiar with, so do take a moment to read that interpretive label to gain an understanding of all the factors that are coming into play that are affecting the lion populations. This is something that's happening really fast, similar to the elephants, like it's speeded up. It's, you know, the, the people, people have known there have been changes in the African lion populations over the past 40 years, but in the past even 10 years or less, it's speeded up really exponentially. And it has to do with not just habitat loss, although that's a small, that's a part of it, but with the cat, with the herdsmen, tribal herdsmen and their cattle, they kill the lions because they don't want the lions to kill their cattle. And then it also has to do with global warming and the increase in disease among the African lions, which that's not completely understood. And it all ha also has to do with civil unrest because you have these nature preserves designed to protect the lions, but when civil unrest makes the whole area unstable, nobody's watching or following the rules, and so that's what they say, if you give to humanitarian causes, you're actually helping the animals on the preserves, which kind of makes sense when you think about it. So do read those labels. And the interactive. Yes, and Carrie's going to talk about that. So one of the things that, Carrie's going to jump in here in just a moment and talk about that, because we want to make sure everybody takes the time to really look at that and listen to all the video options on there. So last winter we did an assessment and then this past spring there was another yeah. assessment. There were two assessments done of how, since the Conservation Gallery was new, we wanted to know what are people doing, how are people liking it, what are they learning. The first assessment was um, five interview questions done last winter, mostly by um, our, our intern, AmeriCorps intern that we had at the time. And she was asking a lot of, you know, what did you enjoy? People said, oh, I enjoyed the art, looking, I really enjoyed the artwork. Did you learn anything new about conservation? Mm, not really, was what they said. So we were like, ooh, we were really hoping to make a more profound conservation message and impact. So, Carrie's going to go from there and talk about what we learned and then what she has done differently and added for an interpretive element. Perfect. Thanks, Jean. Uh, yes, so as Jean said, you know, um, assessments, both observational assessments, which is sort of being a gallery spy, just watching how people move through the galleries, and a little more active assessments, which would involve actually talking to someone and getting some, um, you know, getting information that way. Both those observational and those more engaged or active assessments uh, really do inform a lot of the decisions that we end up making for interpretation, and in some cases even um, you know, the, the choice and placement of the artwork. So they're really, really important um, for, for future exhibits and they help inform decisions to make um, interpretive pieces like these. So this is, it's a touch screen and it's featuring a piece that through our assessments we learned was very powerful um, to, to our visitors. Um, 
for instance, even if they were sort of using this gallery as a throughway and just trying to get into the King Gallery, everyone would stop and look at this. You know, it really commanded people's attention. People wanted to learn more. They were reading the label. They were engaging in conversation about it. They were sharing with us that it was the piece that really um, felt the most powerful and interesting to them. Um, at the same time, we hear um, from you know some of our some of our colleagues who are out in the galleries a lot that a lot of people feel a bit at a loss when they're trying to you know, interpret this piece. What does it mean? Um, and so we wanted to play to all of those perspectives and create an interactive that spoke to that and helped people engage with a piece that they felt was so powerful and so interesting and probably ended up provoking a lot of questions for them. So um, this interactive is designed to speak specifically to Silent Messenger, Is This Bird Dead or Alive? Um, and we have perspectives from five community members, well, four community members and uh, the artist Steve Kestrel. So um, Steve's video is fascinating to watch. Not only does he speak to, you know, the, the process, um, both the physical process of making the piece, but the, you know, the philosophical process of what it took to, to create a piece like this. We also get to see imagery of this piece um, being created over time, which is Fascinating. When you see the rock that that bird originally came from, it, it, it just blows your mind. Um, the visionary, really. But um, it, and so, in addition to getting a little insight from the artist into the physical process of making such a monumental and powerful piece, um, you know, it speaks to what does conservation mean to him? Why did he make this piece? Why is it in our conservation gallery? And then, of course, the broader question: Why is this piece in the collection? Is it so? Um, it's, it's really insightful and powerful, and Steve is incredible on camera, and I would definitely recommend you um, watching his video, as well as the four other videos from community members. So our, our community members that we featured their perspectives on the piece include a third grade student, um, some of you may know her, Biz Carlin, um, doing, doing a really great job um, talking about Silent Messenger, that's Lisa Carlin's granddaughter. Um, we have um, a local uh, scientist, um, and he actually is also a leader at Teton Science Schools, Doug Waka. Uh, fascinating, fascinating perspectives on this piece. His was so hard to edit. It was, he said so many great things. They all did. Um, we have a local educator and author, Kate Cabot, who designed an entire educational program for high school students around this piece. So a fascinating example of what art can do to inspire action in the community. Um, and finally, a college student, uh, Corey Shockley, who uh, was not only in one of Kate's programs, um, that was kind of the main connection, how we found him. So he was you know, one of the students in the program she designed around the piece, but he's also had a relationship with the museum since he's been very young. So uh, fascinating perspectives. We encourage you to, to check them all out. Um, we also have a little, um, a little area here where you can share your thoughts on the video, so hopefully we'll learn about how people are using and responding to this piece. But ultimately, everyone has so many different perspectives on this piece and on conservation and getting people excited about diving into to that gradient and interacting with the art on that level. One of our other um, interpretive offerings is the on-cell cell phone tour. So this was something that we had in the last exhibit. I'd be interested to know how many people knew we had it. Um, the signage was didn't really stick out very well. Uh, we didn't get a ton of usage, not as much as we wanted. So we're doing a little experiment. We redesigned the signs, um, and we're going to see if our usage goes up and if people are, you know, taking taking the opportunity to hear stories from local conservation experts about the pronghorn and the bison in our area. So um, again, another fun example of how we're experimenting and playing with the space and seeing how it impacts visitor experience. So just, this, you know, just a comment. In my presentation, I talked earlier about signage, right aways Present this is exactly what I was talking about. Here is the art artist painting a code, the story, different ways of accessing that information. And I really applaud the staff. I think you've done a great job of uh, putting this together. <laughs> and the, the labels carry you, some of you probably cannot see them from where you are, the labels for the on cell, cell phone tour option. There's a pronghorn story, there's a Wyoming pronghorn story. Very simple graphics, very clean. Um, you dial this number and you press another number and you get it. Similarly, the and a, a Wyoming bison story. Very graphic, uh, stands out from the wall. 
I wish I brought a copy of the old I sign. know, if we could hold it up and show you what the old sign looks like. It, but no one remembers and the And there are very specific <laughs> stories. So community members have told the story specific to the why, you know, what have happened, what's the status of bison in Wyoming? What's the status of pronghorn in Wyoming? What are we doing? What's been done? And there, so uh, Renee Seidler does the pronghorn story, and uh, Franz Palmazine does the bison story. Right. And we did have a wolf story. Yeah. Um, it'll it'll come back when the wolf comes back. So, Jane, we can dial this from anywhere. Any exactly. location. You can do it from home. You can do it from your desk. You'll get that message from anywhere. We need to do it with a flip phone. We're so impressive. And we're really interested to see if the signage makes a difference. We're just going to spend a little bit more time with this piece, since, as Carrie emphasized, visitors are fascinated with this piece. They will come up to it, they will stop, they will look at it, and if they do that, you know, in combination with either, we give them the choice, of course, they can read the label, they can explore it over here, but for any work of art, before anyone goes even into that depth, they start asking themselves questions. So when Kate Cabot did her program with students, she took this same approach, this question inquiry approach. So if you see a visitor standing here, you know, just starting to examine this, you might want to engage them in conversation and say, you know, I notice you looking at this piece. What, can you recognize the species of bird? So I'll ask all of you, well you all know probably, can you recognize the species of bird? Since you all are familiar with this, you probably know that it's a raven. But when we ask this to people who are seeing it for the first time, they are definitely thrown by the scale. And so they say everything from passenger pigeon to penguin, I've heard people say. So it is not obvious. So know that it's not obvious to people who are encountering this for the first time, in large part because of the scale. So another question would be, well, why the raven? Why do you think Steve Kestrel chose to use a raven in telling his message, in, in communicating his message. Any thoughts on that? Who has read the label? Who has talked to Steve Kestrel? Um, because it exists in most continents. On most continents? Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of, has kind of a an universal, iconic culture. Right. And the, the fact that it's been an icon and it exists in a lot of cultures and creation myths is another reason. It's in Native American stories, but not just Native American, other cultural creation myths too. So for Steve, it represents a, a universal bird that. Because some people say, why a raven? They're not in nature, are they? I've had people ask me that. But it's because the raven ha takes on, in his mind, a greater significance, symbolic, to tie across cultures. It's been around for a long time. The creation myth I think, aspect, I think, is important to Steve because the raven was around at the beginning of the world, and you know, as nature is dying off, maybe the raven is something to think about at the end, as these species are dying off. So another question. Um, could be, what is this bird lying in? Sarcophagus, Sarcophagus or a coffin. Um, and then the, you could ask people, what, you know, why? What point is he trying to make by showing it in a tomb? It raises the question, you know, is this bird dying? Is it coming back to life? Is this bird dead or alive is the core question that you'll hear more about in this interactive. Another good question to ask people is, you know, why do you think he chose, if they're confused about the scale and what bird it is because the scale is so out of whack, it's so much bigger than an actual raven, you could ask, well, why do you think he chose to make it on such a grand scale? Um, when you ask that question, you hear people say things like to grab our attention, um, to make a stop in our tracks, and take another look at it. Another thing that sometimes people will say, which I think is really profound, is they say, and this ties into um, Similar answer, some of you may remember when we asked that question of the lost birds of Tom McGreen. Why did he make them all about five feet tall? It's because it's the human scale. It makes us think about our own selves in connection with, um, with this bird, with the death of this bird. We would fit quite nicely in this coffin ourselves. So it makes us think about it in more personal terms. Um, that life and death and humans usually are buried in coffins or certain coffins, not animals. So it gives it's that tie in as well. Um, so back to the question, is it alive or dead? 
um, gets people looking at the position of the head. And most of you, again, are familiar with this piece, so you know that when you look close, you see kind of the, the concave where the head is carved into the stone. It looks like the head was resting inside the sarcophagus in a different position. And now the lid is off, the head is stretching out, which raises the question, touch the bird, you could potentially scratch. Dragging those crystals from one area to the other could scratch. If you're going to touch, you should take off rings and other things that might scratch through the gloves. But it's a chance in a lifetime. Who would like to touch the bird and who would like to touch the sandstone and then tell other people, explain the tactile experience to the rest of the group? I have a pair of Medium gloves in this hand and <laughs> large gloves in this hand. Yeah, go for it, Dan. Who wants to go? Oh, sorry. Okay, go for it, Ron. Ron, <laughs> large gloves, large gloves on this side. Which one is this? That is, it doesn't matter. You decide. What do you want to touch, the sandstone or the granite? Well, I only need one glove. Oh, somebody else. Okay, hand one off to Carol. Okay, how about you two touch the granite of the bird? And just touch it all, all different places, and then we're going to ask you some questions. And then we need two, we can have two sandstone people, two medium sized gloves. Marsha, why don't you be a sandstone person? And Carla, why don't you be another sandstone person? And it doesn't matter left, right, these gloves are interchangeable. <laughs> Mixed up. <laughs> or yours, theirs are going on easier. I bet I got them switched. Okay, you're doing sandstone. Carol, you do granite. You do granite and you do sandstone. How's that sound? Carla, sandstone, Marta, granite. Okay, thanks for coming over. And we have boxes of these gloves in, in my office. So if you ever do come across a visitor who has a particular need or interest, you can come see me. We do need to make sure they touch one or the other, but not both. We need to ask them to take off rings that might scratch, but we are allowed to do this for educational interpretive purposes. Okay, people who are, let's see, the people who are touching the granite, Carol and Marshall. <laughs> Marcia, tell us, what about temperature? It's cold. It's cold? Yeah. What about texture? It's, it's different in different places. This is very steady. <coughs> it's the feather part. It doesn't feel like a feather, but the texture is like the kinds of feathers that you would find here. Ah. Does it step down? Yeah. Primaries to secondaries to... Names of all the feathers, uh -huh. but you can just tell they're different. 